Hi, I'm Kate Vitasic, faculty member at the University of Tennessee's Center for Ex Executive Education, and I'm here today to talk about vested outsourcing and the five rules that will transform outsourcing. So you might ask, why am I so bold to say that five simple little rules could transform outsourcing? Well, it's because I'm passionate about the research we've been doing at the University of Tennessee and studying highly successful buyer-supplier relationships. I like to think I have the best job on the planet because we had funded research from the United States Air Force to study these what we'll call hyper collaborative relationships. They were so successful, some were even called impossible, if you can believe that. Uh, so in our research, uh, we got to study and unpack what made these relationships tick. Why were they successful? And in that, we found that there were five things that they had in common. No matter what it was, if they were buying facilities management, as with Procter & Gamble and Jones Lang LaSalle, if they were doing environmental cleanup, like with the Department of Energy and Kaiser Hill, or Microsoft and Accenture with back office procure to pay, a lot of people laugh and say, well, how could accounting be innovative? Well, it really can. It's in how you actually buy those goods and services. So I want to talk about those five things that we found in our research that actually became a topic of a book called Vested Outsourcing, Five Rules That Will Transform Outsourcing. Now, first and foremost, the business model that these companies use was very different. And that's rule number one, an outcome-based versus a transaction-based business model. Let me explain the difference. In a transaction-based business model, the service provider gets paid, a, let's say, a dollar for every unit of service they did. They show up, they wash the windows, they get a dollar. They clean the toilets, they get a dollar. They answer the phone call, they get a dollar. So it's a value exchange type of relationship. And in a vested relationship, the focus was on the outcomes. Let's talk about P&G and Jones Lang LaSalle. One of my favorite quotes that we had when, our, when we did our research with P&G was, we wanted a service provider that would not just take care of the buildings, but would take charge of the buildings. They wanted someone who would drive innovation, to would radically reduce the cost structure, to would change the way that they actually approached the work. It wasn't about showing up and doing the work. It was about bringing better, innovative ways to do the work. So focusing on the outcomes, not the transactions. So rule number two of vested outsourcing is focus on the what, not the how. In a traditional approach, buyers will issue a statement of work. So they have these statement of works that goes down and they list all the activities. Normally, the smartest person at the buying community will actually write those statement of work. Well, it's based on the way they've always done the work. So think about that. I call it the outsourcing paradox. You outsource to the experts and then you tell them how to do the work. Well, you're going to get the exact same thing that you've always gotten. Well, don't we outsource because it's not a core competency? Don't we want to challenge and drive innovation? If we dictate how the work's done in a statement of work, you're always going to get what's in the statement of work. I like to think of it as green scores and red faces. The service provider is showing up doing exactly what you asked them for, but you're not really happy. And you're not happy because you wanted more. You wanted something cheaper. You wanted something faster. You wanted something better. You wanted, you know, innovation in the grand scheme of things. So we're not buying innovation. We really buy activities. And that gets back to that rule one, activities versus uh, outcomes. And so if we're going to focus on outcomes, we can't tell the service provider how to do the work. We need to step back and offer a statement of objectives instead of a statement of work. And then, once you're clear with the objectives, the service provider would turn around and create what we call a performance work statement, where they would answer the question and say, this is how we're going to do the work. We're going to challenge the old way, and we're going to drive innovation into that, which will drive value for the buyer. Now let's look at rule number three. Rule number three is clearly defined and measurable desired outcomes. So remember we talked about rule one, outcomes? Now's where the rubber meets the road. What we want to do is be very clear in what those outcomes are. I like to use the analogy of Mount Everest, right? So it's very clear what the outcome is to get to the top. If you're Sir Edmund Hillary and singing Nora, his, uh, his, uh, Nora, his Serpa, very clear what that outcome was going to be. To get to the top, put the flag in. Well, when we're buying services, it's sometimes hard to say what those outcomes are, and that's why we fall into that activity trap of 
wanting a statement of work because it's hard to dictate what those serv what, what those uh, outcomes are. So remember, a desired outcome. A desire is something you want and don't have an outcome's result. So you're buying the future. You're buying your Mount Everest. You don't have that today and we have to really search hard to get out of that activity mindset and clearly define and measure our desired outcomes, not SLAs, not the detailed task level service level agreements. So rule number four is a pricing model with incentives. Now I use the word model and I do that for a reason. A price is something that you go to Starbucks and pay $3.29 for your grande two pump vanilla latte. A pricing model really models the business and you want to have incentives. So when the business does well, the service provider does well. In essence, the more value they bring you to your business, the more they should get paid. So there's a direct correlation with value creation. Remember I talked a little bit earlier about how most deal structures today are transaction based. I give you a dollar, you give me a unit of service. In a, in a pricing model structured in a vested manner, it really is about buying value, value creation. One plus one can equal three, four, or five because you create value. Think of the old way, uh, the, the classic analogy that you see in Fisher and Urey's uh, uh, book, Getting to Yes. They talk about the orange, right? And a creative ways to, to slice the orange. Well, I'll get the pulp and you get the rind and that's a win-win. Well, in a vested pricing model, we would put short-term interests aside and we would make investments into the business. We would invest in planting more seeds and then hoping to bear fruit of three, four, or five oranges. So it's an investment-based approach. It's a model with incentives. A rising tide floats all boats and lowers all boats. So we want to uh, be on the same path with our service provider and not in a value exchange price situation. Now that brings us to our last rule, which is rule number five, an insight versus an oversight governance structure. Insight. When I use that word, what does that mean to you, right? It, it really has a different connotation than oversight. Oversight is you're managing the supplier. Insight, you're managing the business with the supplier. So in a nutshell, the governance structures are based around mechanisms that are we mentalities versus a us versus them mentality. Your buyer and the supplier are on the same side of the rope. Let's think about an analogy of that rope, right? So here I am, the buyer and the supplier, tugging together. I'm physically tugging on that rope together. The power that that unlocks is tremendous versus if the buyer and the supplier are on opposite ends of the rope tugging against each other. So our governance structures have a mechanism to allow us to solve business problems, tug together versus SRM, manage the supplier, manage the business, tit for tat back and forth. So in summary, five rules that will transform outsourcing. Rule one, focus on outcomes versus transactions. Rule two, the what, not the how. Rule three, clearly defined and measurable desired outcomes. Rule four, a pricing model with incentives. And rule five, insight versus oversight governance structure. That's it from the University of Tennessee and the ISM conference here in Phoenix, Arizona. Thanks for uh, listening today about vested outsourcing and the five rules that will transform outsourcing.